Life is made of unfair coin flips by alexdanko.com. Today we are going to talk about an interesting journal article that came about two weeks ago, which presents a big idea, formally defining individuality on a biological level in terms of information. I really enjoyed reading this paper and I hope you enjoy this summary and walk through. The paper itself is quite easy to read, the math isn't bad at all. And I encourage you to read it yourself if you are interested. Along the way, we'll have a little math lesson of our own, and by the end of it, you'll know what I mean by the cryptic title Life is Made of Unfair Coin Flips. For some background, there are two large and related open ended questions in biology which we have debated for a long time, and that we should review first. First, there is the problem of emergence. If you start from biology, it is pretty easy to work your way backwards by reducing biology into its component parts. You will find chemistry and physics as its underlying components, with nothing unaccounted for. But it is hard to go the other way. Life is a complicated, adaptive, messy thing. If you start with physics and chemistry, it is hard to identify what exactly is the thing in here that gives rise to life. We say that life is an emergent phenomenon, which lets us dodge the question of emerges through what exactly? The second question which you'll notice is really the same as the first question, just from another angle, is that we have a hard time defining what exactly is an individual. At what point does a collection of molecules comprise an individual of some sort? Can we pin it down with a rule that is defined in terms of the component parts, rather than the behavior of the emergent product? This has proven to be hard to do. We have uneasily settled on three consensus criteria for biological individuality. First. Individuals consume energy and use it to persist and increase in relative frequency. Second, individuals adapt to their environments. Third, the component parts that make up an individual have tightly coordinated relationships with each other. All of these should seem pretty sensible, but they aren't 100% satisfying. They are proxy observations that don't yield a deep connection to the underlying chemistry and physics. Can we do better? This paper presents a really satisfying idea, the fundamental essence of individuality and the units in which individuality ought to be measured is information. If you are dealing with an individual, if you are dealing with the same thing between today and tomorrow and where that sameness just isn't passive inertia but is actively propagated. Individuals maximally propagate information from their past to their future. This propagation is measurable, at least in theory. Therefore, individuality ought to be measurable. There are a few nice properties here. This definition of individuality is continuous and measurable, so it embraces the idea that some entities or processes might have more individuality than others. It is also agnostic to any level of biological organization or abstraction and furthermore allows for the concept of nested individuality. The bacteria in our stomachs can possess some level of individuality while still being part of the system of us with its own individuality. What is best about this definition is that not only is it rigorously true from first principles, it also establishes a crystal clear link between biology and its reductionist components of chemistry and physics. Information is the link between these two things. That may not feel obvious to some people, so we are going to go through another important concept. Probably you have heard before that is entropy. You were probably introduced to entropy in high school or college chemistry, either in terms of Gibbs free energy or Boltzmann's kinetic theory of gases. They are two ways of looking at the same thing, that is, disorder. Disorder is a fundamental property of the universe. The second law of thermodynamics, which is one of those ironclad laws of the world, 
Still place that total entropy in the universe is always increasing. All living organisms have to continually burn calories and do work to overcome disorder. Even reactions that appear to create order, like an ice cube freezing, can only happen if there is corresponding release of heat to the outside world, creating an increase in disorder. At a molecular and particle level, the total number of possible microstates for any given microstate, say water at 5 degrees Celsius, is a manifestation of the disorder. More disorder means more potential states. One way to visualize entropy is to imagine an ice crystal in the moment before versus after it melts. In its frozen state, water droplets are fixed in a lattice pattern where there are empty spaces next to water molecules that are predictably unoccupied. Upon the instant that it melts, those water particles can occupy either of those positions. The water has become more disordered now. Okay, besides thermodynamics, it is also possible that you have learned about the concept of entropy somewhere else. If you are an electrical engineer or a CS major, you have probably learned information theory at some point. Well, information theory is about transmitting information through a noisy channel from a source to destination. If you remember correctly, information which we measured in bits meant the amount of uncertainty there is to resolve and it often went by another name, entropy. This isn't just a coincidence. Both Shannon's entropy, which is talking about information, and Boltzmann's entropy, which is talking about thermodynamics. These are all the same thing. They are just a measurement of disorder. If you go back to our melting ice crystal example, at the moment our ice melts, the amount of uncertainty in the position of the water molecules increases by one bit per molecule. The information of the water molecules position and the thermodynamic entropy of the melting process are one and the same. Astonishingly, if you do the math on the melting ice cube as a thermodynamic process versus as a communicated message about water molecule position, you will get the same answer. I don't know about you, but I think this is pretty cool. Shannon's definition of entropy turned out to be a lot more powerful than Boltzmann's because it is so general. Communication over a noisy channel. If you generalize it, it is the challenge of getting a state to propagate faithfully from A to B, which is not just place to place, it is also over time or from one process to another. Information theory would be talking about Alice on one end and Bob on the other end of the phone. Or it could also mean the sender is your parents, the recipient is you, and the message is the DNA that you inherit from them. Or the sender could be just you 20 years ago, the recipient is you today, and the message is that arrangement of neurons and synapses in your brain that have somehow retained every single word of the song you liked, even though you haven't heard that song in years. So, what does it mean for individuals and organisms to propagate information from their past to their future? Okay, let's talk about mathematics of entropy. The simplest thought experiment for understanding entropy is a coin flip, simple coin flip. When you flip a fair coin, there is one bit of entropy in the flip. It could be either head or tail, equal probability. When the flip is revealed to be tail, you resolve one bit of information. Does that make sense to you? Okay, now imagine that instead of a fair coin, it is an unfair one. And you know you land 
tails every time. If there is no surprise when it lands, then there are zero bits of entropy in the flip. There is no certainty to resolve. So what about a slightly unfair coin? There will be somewhere between zero bits and one bit. Minimum amount of uncertainty is zero bit. And then maximum is one bit, right? So the fairness of the coin tells you how disorderful the coin is. Okay, let's talk about math. It is worth actually going through the math of an information theory problem in order to really wrap your head around what it means to make a process lower entropy or less disorderful. You have the right to skip the math part if you want, but it is elegant and approachable, and that is interesting. So, the total amount of entropy in a state as of S is equal to the sum of the probability of each possible microstate occurring that is p of s times the number of yes or no questions you would have to ask on average to deduce that particular microstate out of all the possible states the log base two part if you think about this it is not scary imagine you are playing a game of 20 questions and you are trying to guess out of eight equal weighted possibilities if you go about it methodically, it will take you three guesses. Two to the third power, log base two of one by eight equals three. In our fair coin example, it is trivial for each side. The probability is 0 0.5, and it would take you one yes or no question to figure it out. So the total amount of entropy is 0.5 times 1 heads plus 0.5 times 1 tails, that is 1 bit. I guess you knew that, right? Okay, now let's do a slightly harder one. In our melting ice example, let's say our ice crystal has 12 possible states and that they are equally likely. On average, if you were playing the question game, it would take you 3.5 with yes or no questions to correctly guess 1 out of 12. So 3.58 bits of entropy is there. I think that is simple, right? Now let's try to change it up a bit. Now we have a new ice cube, still with 12 states, where there are two especially likely states. 50% more likely than most and two unlikely states, which are 50% as likely. So let's add it up. Two states have probability of 0 0.125 or 1 by earth, which implies on average it will take three yes or no questions to figure it out. Eight states have probability 0 0.8333 on average. 3.58 yes or no questions, same as before. Two states have probability 0 0.41666 on average. That is 4.58 yes or no questions, lower probability means more questions. Now after adding these three, we will get 3.51 bits. Notice that this number is a little bit smaller, this is important. Our second ice cube is a little bit more like an unfair coin than the first ice cube was. It is a little bit more predictable because some microstates are more likely than others. So lower entropy means more microstates are more likely than others for some predictable reason. Just try to compare, in the previous configuration we had 3.58 bits and now we have 3.51 bits. So this is a little smaller, so that means like this particular configuration is more predictable than the previous one. So that means, what, just imagine. So this means that if everything is predictable then there is not so much information we can gain. So that means like the entropy is zero in information theory. Uh, I can try another example. Suppose uh, you have to send a message from point one to point two, and like suppose the message is always hello world, then the user at point B will always know that the message will be hello world. So there will be no any randomness in that. So there will be no information gain in that. So the entropy of that system is always zero. Also, you might be wondering why log base two? Why is entropy restricted to uncertainty between two and only two choices? 
Shannon cleverly resolved this by arguing that any uncertainty between more than two choices can be further broken down, like a decision tree. Until at some point we get to choices that are sufficiently small that we stop caring past this point. This is called course craning. So now let's talk about mutual information in the individual. So how do individuals reduce entropy? If you are an individual or an organism or some other ordered process, your goal is to get disorder under control and then keep it that way. The last concept to walk through is a concept called mutual information. Mutual information is important whenever the receiver of a message has the opportunity to acquire information from somewhere else. If the receiver of a message already knows something about the message ahead of time, then the message will be less surprising to them. Imagine guessing the top card of a shuffle deck versus guessing that top card if you already know that all of these pets have been shuffled to the top. It pays uh, to reduce entropy in advance. Mutual information is really important whenever we deal with the question if information propagating from one place to another or one time to another. For example, if my knowledge about uh, a lyrics stays perfectly consistent as years go by, then we might say that there is total mutual information between the state of me back in the days versus now. On the other hand, lyrics that I have totally forgotten means uh, mutual information between then and now is zero. And that is simple. In a more serious vein, a biological organism does something very similar with respect to every cell, every enzyme and every metabolic processes that is made of. Let's take an example for the enzyme. A biological enzyme which catalyzes a chemical reaction in one particular direction is a bit like an unfair coin. If an enzyme drives a chemical reaction forward in consistent and predictable way, that is like a sophisticated version of an unfair coin. It resolves uncertainty about something. Same with the DNA and RNA which pass information forward that reduce uncertainty about a downstream cascade of chemical reactions. All of the biological stuff you are made of exist in order to decrease entropy and then pass that condition forward in time. A simple single cell organism, even a really striped down one, exist in order to pass information forward in the form of unfair coins. When a process appears to be doing work to actively perpetuate the amount of information that it is transmitting forward in time and furthermore, if it is seeking to maximize that information passed forward, then you are probably dealing with something we should consider to be an individual. So let's talk about the paper I have mentioned in the beginning. There the authors go through all of the various permutations of individuals perpetuating mutual information into the future. Both internal information and information that exist with respect to the environment. In all of these cases, whether it is reproduction, adaptation or internal self-regulation and metabolism, individuality is a matter of temporal uncertainty reduction. With this new definition, it extends smoothly and easily out of physics and chemistry, as the authors put it. What is fundamental in our view is the idea that information can be propagated forward through time by individuals, meaning that uncertainty is reduced over time. In this way and returning to our opening remarks, we suggest individuality is a natural extension of the ideas of Boltzmann and von Neumann, and as such has foundations in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, which consider the conditions required for persistently ordered states. So finally, we can answer, how do organisms pass mutual information forward? Either information about themselves or information about their environments, colony level information or all of the above. Here is where we get back to the concept of course craning. There are certain units of information that are sufficiently chunked together 
by DNA nucleotides that comprise a genetic code that they place lower bound on how they finally resolve a piece of information must be in order for its fidelity to be maintained. When our DNA is passed forward across cell division or across generations, that information is coarse grained into A, T, C and Gs. Coarse graining allows us to pass mutual information forward from time today to time tomorrow. We pass that information forward in the form of countless little pieces of unfair coins, like enzymes and nucleotides that make up our metabolic processes and genetic codes, all of which make sure that the uncertainty we are resolving today is the same as the uncertainty we are resolving tomorrow. So now let's try to conclude the whole idea of life is made of unfair coin flips. Life is made of unfair coin flips which we propagate forward into the future in order to make sure our future selves have the same advantage over entropy as we do. I think that is pretty neat. Hopefully you enjoyed this and learned something from it. If you did, I encourage you to read the original paper. So these uh, words or ideas aren't mine but I really loved them. Uh, I really loved how author articulated the idea of entropy into the life itself. And time and again I keep on thinking about entropy in, as a meaning of life itself. Mm, there are a few articles I can recommend. So maybe I will try to put them in some, in, so in some places where everybody can access those and maybe I might write my own original uh, write-up or essay about these things these things which you might understand or might try to understand uh, never mind but it is okay that to speculate about these ideas and thoughts because uh, life is uh, time-bounded and there are so many things and ideas that we haven't even thought of but someone else might be thinking right now at this right moment so maybe just maybe think about entropy in the first place for a life to be meaningful maybe life isn't meaningful maybe it is absurd maybe it has some meaning for you and for some it is useless to think about these questions but for me as a nihilist or more like a pessimist nihilist i try to think about these concepts as something to encourage myself to learn even more and speculate about the life and about the universe because we are after all a dot in a dot earth is a dot and we are just a dot in a earth so we are just dot in a dot and cheers life is made of unfair coin flu so you'd better fear flip the coins <laughs> so see you again